Hello, and welcome to the IVF Lab at the Reproductive Science Center of the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm Dr. Kristen Ivani, Lab Director at RSC. Many of the most important, interesting, and exciting events in a patient's IVF cycle occur in the embryology lab, which most people never see. So let's step inside and go behind the scenes to see how it all works. We'll start with the first step of the IVF cycle, the egg retrieval process. The IVF lab is located next to the operating room where a doctor collects fluid from the ovaries into a tube. Next, a nurse passes this tube containing what we call the follicular aspirate to an embryologist who then pours the tube into a dish and looks for the eggs under a microscope. After locating the eggs, the embryologist rinses them and places them into a holding dish. After washing the eggs a second time, the embryologist gives each a maturity grade, places them into a dish labeled with the patient's name and a unique identifier number, and puts the dish into an incubator to keep the culture conditions as close to natural body conditions as possible. If a patient is using fresh sperm, the male partner goes into a private collection room and collects a sperm sample at the same time the egg retrieval is taking place. When he brings his sample to the tech, his identification is verified with a photo ID and the sample is assigned a unique identifier number. The sample is washed to remove the seminal fluid and to separate the modal from the immodal sperm. For patients using frozen sperm, whether from a partner or from a sperm donor, two embryologists will verify the identity of the frozen sample and match it with the female partner before thawing. About four to six hours after the egg retrieval, we inseminate the eggs. At this point, the embryologist will use one of two insemination techniques. One is called microdrop or conventional insemination, and the other is called intracytoplasmic sperm injection, or ICSI. We make the choice of insemination method based primarily on the sperm quality. Long before the egg retrieval and before the female partner's IVF cycle has even started, the male partner has already provided a semen sample for evaluation. This gives us an idea of his sperm quality and also indicates which of the two methods of insemination this patient will need. To avoid any potential mix-up, two embryologists always confirm the identity of the sperm and eggs before insemination. We use ICSI for patients with low sperm count low motility, or poor sperm morphology. We may also use ICSI if the patient had poor fertilization on a prior cycle with conventional insemination. With ICSI, the embryologist selects a single sperm cell and uses a tiny needle to inject it into the egg under a microscope. We try to select the best looking forward moving sperm whenever possible. But if the sperm sample quality is good, and we've decided to use standard insemination, the embryologist inseminates the eggs by placing them together with the sperm in a dish of insemination media. This fluid is specially designed to facilitate fertilization events over the next half day. Once all of the eggs have been inseminated, the embryologist puts them back into the incubator until the following morning. This completes the process on the day of the egg retrieval, which we call day zero. The next morning, on day one, we do a fertilization check under a microscope to see how many eggs have fertilized normally. At this point in time, we're looking for the presence of two pronuclei, one nucleus from the sperm and one nucleus from the egg. The pronuclei contain the genetic information. If we don't see any pronuclei, that means the egg did not fertilize. If we see just one pronucleus, or, if we see more than two pronuclei, the egg has fertilized abnormally and would not be used for transfer or freezing. At this point, the embryologist separates out the embryos that have two pronuclei. These embryos are called zygotes, 2PNs, or fertilized eggs. These terms may be used interchangeably. The embryologist now puts the one-cell embryos into a new dish of media that supports the early stages of embryo development. During these stages, the embryo grows through a process called cleavage, in which new cells duplicate from existing cells. On the morning of day two, the embryos should have two to four cells. 
We do not evaluate the embryos on day two because they have better chances of growing normally if they are not out of the incubator for extended periods of time. We know from our own historical data that about 98% of the embryos will cleave from the one cell stage. On the morning of day three, it has now been 72 hours since the egg retrieval. The embryologist removes the dish from the incubator and looks for the embryos that have divided into six to eight cells. The embryologist grades the embryos on a scale of one to five, with grade one being the best quality and day five being a poor quality embryo. Occasionally, the embryologist finds that not all of the embryos have developed to eight cells. That's because some arrest developmentally and may stop dividing. We then move the embryos into another type of culture medium that supports growth from day three to day five. We then leave the embryos undisturbed until the morning of day five. By day five, the embryos have gone through significant changes, and each embryo has grown from eight cells to somewhere around 60 to 100 cells. These embryos are called blastocysts, and they are differentiating now into two cell types. One is called the inner cell mass that will become the baby, and the other cell type is the trophectoderm, which becomes the placenta. We grade the embryos and decide which will be transferred to the uterus and which embryos may be frozen for future use. The number of transferred embryos is going to be fewer for a blastocyst or day five transfer than for a day three transfer. At the Reproductive Science Center, we schedule about 70% of our patients for a day five embryo transfer. Of those day five transfers, about 60% of patients will have an elective single embryo transfer, or ESET. There are a number of reasons for having a blastocyst transfer. Pregnancy and implantation rates are higher for blastocysts, and we can limit or even eliminate the number of higher order multiple pregnancies, triplets and quadruplets, by transferring fewer embryos. Blastocyst transfer better reflects the natural process as well. Normally, in the earliest stages of pregnancy, an embryo travels from the women's fallopian tubes to the uterus by day five. While we perform day five transfers in the majority of our patients, not every patient is a candidate for blastocyst transfer. Patients with delayed embryo development or who have few embryos may not be good candidates for blastocyst transfer. There's a very small chance, less than 5%, that someone with nice embryos on day three would have no embryos for transfer on day five. If we look at the embryos on day five and they're not quite as developed as we'd like, then we might cancel the transfer, freeze the embryos on day six, and transfer them later in a frozen embryo transfer cycle. Over the last several years, RSC has focused our efforts on elective single embryo transfer, or ESET. ESET is an excellent option for patients who really only want to transfer one embryo. A patient may choose ESET because they have a special risk of difficulty if they conceive multiples, or perhaps for spiritual reasons she prefers not to freeze lots of embryos. We perform ESET in about 60% of patients using their own eggs, and in about 80% of our egg donation cycles with no less chance of pregnancy than if we had transferred two embryos. This has allowed us to significantly decrease our multiple pregnancy rates resulting in fewer complications for both the mother and the baby. On day five and six, we freeze the embryos using an ultra rapid freezing procedure known as vitrification. A successful cryopreservation program enables the patient to limit the number of fresh embryos transferred because you have confidence that if the cycle were not successful, you still have a good chance of pregnancy with transfer of your frozen embryos. We vitrify all of our embryos at the blastocyst stage and the survival rate is about 97%. One technological breakthrough in the lab that's brought hope to thousands of patients worldwide is pre-implantation genetic testing also known as PGT or PGD or PGS. We perform this test on blastocyst embryos to help detect chromosomal abnormalities or the presence of a known genetic disease. P. 
PGT may also be used for treating recurrent pregnancy loss or advanced maternal age. The technique has also been used for patients with repeated implantation failure in which there may be a chromosomal cause. During the embryo biopsy procedure, the blastocyst embryo is held gently in place with a holding pipette. A small piece of the trophectoderm tissue is aspirated into the biopsy pipette and a specially designed laser is used to lyse the cells from the embryo. The embryo is returned to the incubator and will be frozen individually until the PGS results are received. The biopsied cells are carefully rinsed through a series of wash drops to remove any biopsy medium or cellular material. The cells are then carefully pipetted into a small test tube labeled specifically for that patient and that embryo. The tubes are then frozen until the courier arrives to send them to the genetics laboratory. Results are received in about a week and the physician will call and discuss the results with the patient. Pre-implantation genetic screening and diagnosis is an exciting and rapidly advancing area of research in reproductive medicine. Much work is being done enabling the detection of more genetic diseases through PGD and also in the effectiveness of using PGT for treating recurrent pregnancy loss, repeated implantation failure, and advanced maternal age. From everyone at the Reproductive Science Center, thank you for spending time with our embryology team to learn more about the IVF lab and the work we do behind the scenes to help increase your chance of success.